the latest news, history, and analysis from the perspective of the first Christians. Tune into the FBN Worldwide 24 7 radio stream. With all the stories and hype surrounding the treasures held at the Vatican and famous religious artifacts like the Shroud of Turin and the Dead Sea Scrolls, it's interesting to observe the things that aren't given attention by the media. The things barely allowed a fleeting footnote in subscript, buried deep in the dusty appendix of a crumbling academic tome. Beyond contemplating the object itself, it's sometimes more interesting to explore the possible reasons why something so important isn't just ignored, but more accurately, aggressively ignored, studiously and purposefully ignored. And meanwhile, the fanciful nonsense contained in Dan Brown novels is glorified and given the air of respectability, gilded with the trappings of pomp and circumstance, its fictional storylines brought to life by the biggest movie stars and massive blockbuster Hollywood budgets and marketing campaigns, breathless non-stop promotion and red carpet accolades, the lie exalted. The truth ignored. In today's episode, we take a closer look at one of these ignored wonders. Like the very first Christian Bible of 144 AD, you probably never heard of it. It's the oldest inscription in the world bearing the name of Jesus. A simple thing really to look at it. Just Greek letters carved into a stone archway in 318 AD and dedicating a small Syrian church with the words to our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Good. Now, you would think it would be worthy of mention, the oldest inscription of Jesus' name in the world. Surely some famous novelist or movie producer would find such a thing of interest. If not, give it a story unto itself, at least a mention somewhere. Nope. But why? Probably because it's a huge embarrassment. It's a theological stick in the eye to the establishment. And really, there's nothing they can do about it except ignore it and hope nobody pays attention to it. You see, unlike written words and letters that can be edited or translated to in verse or play games with their meaning, you can't play games with words that are carved into a rock. The problem isn't so much the words carved into the rock as it is the church that they're dedicated to. It's a Marcionite church. The Marcionites are their favorite thing to ignore. They aggressively ignore them almost as much as they do the first Christian Bible that served as the bedrock of faith for the Marcionites and the first Christians. You see, the Marcionites knew that the deity portrayed in the Hebrew Bible, they renamed it to the Old Testament, that deity isn't the Christian God we know from the New Testament and the first Christian Bible. It's not the God revealed to us through Christ. And not only did the Marcionites know it, they proved it. Let that sink in. Let the ramifications of such a thing bounce off the bumpers of the theological pinball machine you thought you knew and understood. Yeah, the barbaric deity in that Old Testament has nothing to do with God. In fact, Jesus knew that, and they killed him because of it. The Marcionites also knew it. And that's why the first Christian Bible didn't have an Old Testament. And that, you see, is the problem. Are you starting to understand why this inscription, this Jesus rock, is such a thorny issue? You start talking about the inscription, and the next question is, what church? Whose church? The Marcionites? Who were they? What did they believe? See the problem? The rock not only gives the Marcionites undisputed theological provenance and lineage, it opens up a very large and cumbersome can of worms for the establishment. It's something that Jews and most Christians agree should be left alone. So don't expect any Dan Brown novels or Steven Spielberg movies Harrison Ford and his entourage won't be swashbuckling their way to this church in Syria anytime soon. The inscription is dated 318 AD, but it's what happened shortly before when the real story begins. One of
of the things I like about inscriptions carved into rocks is that they're impervious to the actions of liars and editors. Dissemblers, Judaizers, and liars were a dime a dozen in the first few centuries after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and they were masters of their craft, no different from today. We often think of those years as a time of peace when Christianity was established, yet nothing really could be farther from the truth. Those years were the unholy vessel of a theological war that raged unabated between the Judaizers and the first Christians, even pitting apostle against apostle. In 48 AD, that battle didn't end, but a fragile truce was called at the Council of Jerusalem in which 613 Hebrew laws of the Judaizers were unceremoniously and rightfully tossed into the theological dumpster. No longer would Christians be subject to self-mutilation and laws about which parts of a bug were okay to eat or under what circumstances they were to cut off the hand of a woman. And by the way, these weren't considered run-of-the-mill laws like littering or jaywalking. These laws were considered to be the literal word of God. Think about that. That's right. According to the Jews, God himself took time out of the day to tell them what leg segments of a bug to eat and how when cutting off a woman's hand they were to, and I quote, show her no mercy. The deity that these people worshipped is truly barbaric and reprobate. In any event, the apostles agreed. Peter, James, and the Judaizers, with their 613 alien laws, had been temporarily defeated, and the Apostle Paul moved on to become the greatest evangelizer in the world, spreading Christianity throughout. Without Paul, and later with advocates like Marcion, who was responsible for compiling the first Christian Bible, it's doubtful the church would have survived extremely doubtful. But ultimately, the Judaizers did finally get their way, and they won the turf battle in 325 AD at the Council of Nicaea, when the Hebrew Bible, renamed the Old Testament to further confuse the issue, was stapled onto the first Christian Bible. The scrolls celebrating an alien Hebrew war god were nailed onto our faith. And from there, they launched a full assault on the first Christians. It was a scorched earth campaign that lasted centuries, and it was backed by the full force and fury of the Roman Empire, led by Constantine, who was a worshiper of the Roman sun god Saul Invictus. The first Christians, like the Marcionites, were hunted down, had their churches sacked and looted, and their Bibles, the first Bible, pure and without the alien Hebrew scribblings, were confiscated and burned. But it didn't stop there. The Judaizers employed writers, we know them today as hacks, to lie about the Marcionites and their beliefs. Hacks, like Tertullian, spent their whole career demonizing the first Christians. Well, not his whole career. He was also well known for writing about women's fashion trends of the day. In the end, even the Catholics dismissed him as a fraud, with St. Jerome himself remarking, quote, As to Tertullian, I have nothing else to say except he was not a man of the church, unquote. In some of his poisonous scribblings, Tertullian even lashes out at the Apostle Paul, branding him the Apostle of Heretics. Well, so much for Tertullian cut loose by his paymasters without even a proper thank you for all those dirty jobs. And other hacks would meet similar inglorious fates and banishment. But the first Christians, like the Marcionites, persevered, converting millions of people to Christianity and growing larger than even the Catholic Church itself at one point. It thrived for a millennia. You see, back then, when you became a Christian, you embraced and believed in the Gospel of the Lord. You were set in the fact that God was only revealed through Jesus, not through the Hebrew scrolls of the Old Testament and the barbaric deity portrayed within it. Today, the Marcionite Church is rebuilding, and evidence of it still exists. Not only did they compile the first Christian Bible, they created the earliest known inscription bearing the name of Jesus. It was found by a French archaeologist carved into the doorway of an ancient Marcionite church in a little town in Syria called Lababa. Today it's known as Deir Ali. 
The archaeologists featured the inscription in a book in 1870. And for purposes of transcriptions for the show, I just want to read what the um, uh, book information is. It's Waddington, Inscriptions de la Serie, Paris, 1870. Inscription number 2558, page 582. The full title of the book is Inscriptions Greek et Latinus de la Serie by William Henry Waddington, uh, apparently published by La Irma de Brettschneider in 1870. The site of Deir Ali is some three miles south of Damascus. The town was historically a village known as Lababa and contains the archaeological remains of a Marcionite church. These remains include an inscription dated to 318 AD, 318 which is the oldest known surviving inscribed reference anywhere to Jesus. We are further informed that the co-author of the Syriac inscription book is Philippe Labas, L-E-B-A-S. The inscription was carved in 318 AD, bearing the words, Lord and Savior, Jesus the Good, and it is the oldest inscription of Jesus' name in the world. So there you have it. Uh, with these Marcionites, they had the first Bible and the oldest inscription. You know, maybe you should take a look at the Marcionite Church. I'm going to have links in the show notes so you can uh, check out their website at marcionitechurch.org. This has been Darren Kalama, and we'll see you next time on the Right Bible Podcast.